Okay, um, my name is Ganesh Acharya. I uh, come from Nepal originally. So I was born in Nepal to a, a mother who already had quite a few children. I was lost in the family and my mother was 40 year old when I was born. And it was a home delivery. And I am an obstetrician. I am preconditioned to hypoxia because I lived in high altitude in Nepal. Yeah, so my brain may function a little bit slow, but you know, um, you have to bear with me. Here is a picture uh, when in 2009, with uh, quite a number of Scandinavian colleagues, we <coughs> went up to the mountains um, near Everest Base Camp. Uh, you, you may recognize uh, some of them are also from KI professors here. Mm. After finishing my college, I started my journey uh, to explore a little bit. I studied medicine. I got a government scholarship to study medicine in Ukraine at the time, Soviet Union, uh, in a beautiful city called Lvov, quite close to Poland, um, not destroyed during the war, um, and uh, quite an old university, older than KI. Yeah. I then uh, moved back to Nepal because to, I have to pay back my stipend. So I worked in Nepal for six years, initially as a surgeon and then as an obstetrician and gynecologist. I did my residency and then I decided to move further to do further postgraduate training in obstetrics and gynecology and I went to uh, United Kingdom. And um, I worked there and trained there for seven years. In 2001, uh, I was invited to come to Norway to establish a fetal medicine unit in the very north part of the country uh, in University of Tromsø and University Hospital of North Norway. And um, I had been working there until two years ago um, before I moved to KI. In between, I have been to USA to do some postdoc training um, a couple of years and then I also have been to China for about four months and Shanghai and I have been to um, <coughs> been to Oxford for a little sabbatical to do some clinical and academic training. My research interests um, are quite broad. Our specialty, the specialty of obstetrics and gynecology is unique because it is the only specialty that looks after people from before birth until they die. There are many other specialties and subspecialties, but they look after a specific group of patients. We have a privilege of looking after women from birth to death, one could say. And also we have a privilege of helping people to create life, if you like. So my uh, research interests are quite broad, I would say, um, mostly uh, related to pregnancy complications and placenta, preconception health, using novel technologies uh, to understand fetal physiology and apply them in clinical practice, and managing high-risk pregnancy to make labor and delivery safe, and understanding the mechanism behind uh, why people with pregnancy complications, women with pregnancy, later on are at risk of developing problems. My main area of interest, I would say, is maternal fetal circulation and cardiac function of the fetus. I am very interested to know what determines fetal placental development and the fetal growth. I think it is crucial to understand the mechanism behind so that we are able to translate that into clinical practice. I am very interested in understanding pathophysiology and improving the treatment of preeclampsia, a condition that is caused by placenta. I have worked many years with establishing 
normal reference values for circulation of the fetus and the mother. They are used worldwide and I am quite proud of that. Uh, it is an imperative that one has proper reference values uh, before we can talk about abnormality. So understanding that is in my opinion quite important. We have been studying maternal cardiac function in pregnancy because it is very interesting that pregnant women are actually increasing their cardiac function performance hugely during pregnancy. Their blood volume increases by about 40 percent during pregnancy and they have to pump a huge amount of blood while they are carrying the baby. It is almost like doing intensive training throughout nine months of pregnancy. How they cope with that? Even those who have certain abnormality and disease, it's very interesting. If we could understand that, perhaps we could understand better how to treat people with heart failure. Yeah. We use not only human, uh, <laughs> human uh, subjects to understand these things, but certain things we must have animal models to understand uh, uh, deeper, go deeper into the uh, understanding of pathophysiology. So we use um, um, several animal models. We have used rats and mice. You can do even quite, com you know, ult ultrasound even in uh, rat and mice, even e even in the fetuses. This is is the um, ductus venosus Doppler of a mice fetus. Okay, so that's tiny, tiny, and that is in even in the human. So it is possible to to get. Uh, as something like that uh, in experimental uh, conditions. Yeah. Uh, here you see the coronary flow of the mother, mice mother. Yeah. So also possible to study that kind of thing. Uh, it's not only just the molecular things, but also in, you know. Uh, and we try to understand a bit better the fetal cardiac function and uh, circulatory physiology in normal situation and in disease, especially in hypoxemia and the low oxygen conditions and try to apply newer technologies such as newer ultrasound technology to be able to translate that into clinical practice. To do that, we use of course animal model and it needs to be bigger than mice model <laughs> because uh, otherwise it is not so easy to do it. We have a sheep lab that I have been working together with colleagues in Finland, uh, from UK, from USA uh, for several, several years, 16 years now. Yeah. Uh, every year, uh, once or twice a year we meet and we do some experiments. The sheep. Um, and the aim is, of course, to apply what we learn from lab into clinical practice. In my opinion, all biomedical research is to improve the health of people eventually. That's where we want to go. Life starts here, right? That's the sperm. It's a very small single cell. That's the ovum, they meet and then the life starts, right? But even the function of those single cells are not quite well understood until today. Yeah, they are available for research, yeah, but still there is a lot to understand. We have been trying to also study this using some other microscopic, a little better microscopic techniques if you like uh, and also to be able to do research on live cells rather than cultured or, uh, or uh, you know uh, fixed cells like doing histopathology on fixed cells because 
everything we do to cells changes things. Even when we are trying to do something in live cells, uh, like sperm, we have realized that just freezing them would actually change their physiology, even uh, the, the, their uh, structure, I would say. Today, it is possible to see what we could not do um, in 1950s, for example, let's say, you know, ultrasound started in mid 1960s to be applied to obstetrics. And it has made very good progress, I would say. And today, you can see fetus from about six, seven weeks to, you know, here about 20, 20 weeks. Uh, and, and how they grow and what happens, even how they behave, you could uh, even see that. Of course, how to interpret these things and how to what to do about it is another issue. You can diagnose quite a number of fetal anomalies today, yeah, which is a great thing. And things can go wrong, as you know. Yeah, um, pregnancy is a normal thing; it's a physiology. But things go, can go wrong with the fetus as well as with the mother. And even just looking at the birth defects, this is a paper from one of the groups in Utah, USA, and they recently published this paper showing that major congenital defects can happen about in the population-based study, not in the hospital-based study, about 2%, and about one in five of them, we do not know why they happen. We cannot pin, uh, underpin the cause of the defect. That's, in a way, quite worrying. Unless we understand why something happens, it is very difficult to treat. Yeah. Ultrasound and genetic revolution has happened in recent years. Ultrasound has helped us really to do in utero imaging to see what is happening through a little window uh, inside the uterus. And ultrasound, in parallel with ultrasound, uh, the genetic um, techniques, the molecular genetic techniques have really um, improved. And today, we can do pre-implantation genetic screening and diagnosis on people who have some single gene defects, for example, and choose the embryo that does not have the defect to be implanted, to be put back in the uterus with, you know, assisted reproductive technology, and then have a, a healthy baby. Today, we can take a sample of mother's blood and test for chromosome defects like Down syndrome, Edward syndrome, uh, and, and see how that can be diagnosed more or less. Uh, of course, you may need a confirmatory diagnosis by other technique, but uh, you can be fairly certain you see what is happening. Yeah. Of course, you can detect quite a number of anomalies uh, in utero already in the first trimester from at, at about uh, 12, 14 weeks, quite a number of, 50% of anomalies that can be detected by ultrasound uh, can be detected perhaps uh, in uh, using ultrasound yeah. techniques because the resolution has become much better. Here you can see a fetus with a big edema in the neck. Um, and here you can see a tricuspid regurgitation of the tricuspid valve, leakage of the valve because of uh, in a fetus with abstains anomaly. Maybe you don't know this when the uh, arterialization of ventricle is it's an anomaly, uh, not so good one. And here um, a, another Doppler pattern in a fetus with um, with absent pulmonary valve syndrome. Yeah. However. I, although I am going to talk about saving fetuses' life, you have to remember that the mother is the priority. Okay. Here you see a twin pregnancy outside the uterus. Okay, it's a plot here. These are two fetuses, but they are in the tube. Here is the picture when I put a telescope inside the abdomen, a laparoscopy, uh, to uh, treat this, and you see some blood already here and here. And there are two fetuses in the tube on the right side. So you, of course, need to remove this tube to avoid this rupturing and having a huge intraperitoneal bleeding, and uh, um, which can be very dangerous, actually. Yeah, people can die. 
and very rare thing can also happen. Here is you see a fetus in the spleen of the mother growing. You can get pregnant anywhere to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but uh, that is very dangerous. Yeah, a spleen can rupture and uh, you can you can have a very serious uh, situation. Yeah. Um, we help people but also we have to be aware that we do not do harm. The first principle of medicine is do no harm. Today maybe we do much more interventions than necessary. Uh, this woman I saw in the labor ward when I changed the duty, it's not in a developing country by the way, it's in a de very developed country. Uh, and um, I was told that this woman is fully dilated, nearly there to deliver, perhaps you can go and examine and maybe do uh, an instrumental delivery like a vacuum or forceps and she could be delivered. When I went in and examined this woman, her uh, fetal heart rate was not looking so good. There were big uh, decelerations uh, in the fetal heart rate trace. Um, the mother had epidural, so anesthesia, so she did not have much pain. But when I examined her vaginally, I could not see, find any presenting part. No head, no bottom, nothing. I can't feel anything. So I took her to the operating theater immediately. Immediately means immediately, immediately, immediately. And this baby was lying transverse up in the abdomen of the mother, out of the uterus. It was delivered already through this incision, through this uh, rupture, not incision, you know, of the uterus. So it was a uterine rupture. That baby was saved, fortunately, but could have been dead. This mother did not have, the, she had a previous seizure in section, but that baby had not survived. So I decided not to remove this uterus, although it looked horrible, because I did not know what would happen with this baby either, uh, but to repair it. Yes, it is possible to repair, but how it will function is of course another issue and how we will control this pregnancy in the next time is another issue. So you always have to be careful about what you do and always think about what the consequences are going to be. I generally say we cannot save the whole world. <laughs> And this applies also to the fetuses. There are certain conditions it is impossible to say. Yeah. If you have a baby with trisomy 13 or trisomy 18, they are most likely to die, even if they survive uh, the delivery and the birth. And um, in a few months, they will they will certainly die. A baby like this would not survive either. Old days, it was impossible to detect these conditions, but today with ultrasound, we do not have to wait until baby is delivered to detect this condition. And this is, of course, this baby, you cannot do a head transplantation, so there is no way of this baby surviving ever, right? There are conditions should, that should be and could be treated in utero while babies are still inside the uterus. Old days, if somebody has, if the mother has a rhesus negative blood group, father has a rhesus positive blood group, and you know, they had uh, a baby which is rhesus fetus that is rhesus positive, it was possible that the antibodies will develop and they will cross the placenta and they will create hemolysis of the red blood cell of the fetus and the fetus will be anemic. It will have very low hemoglobin hematocrit. And these babies could die inside because they will develop heart failure, high drops inside and die or come out very severely sick and they will need some exchange transfusion. But it was very difficult to diagnose. Today, we can diagnose this non-invasively just by doing the Doppler ultrasound of the middle cerebral artery the brain, you know, circle of Willis and then the middle cerebral artery going there, right, this one, and then you take the blood flow and then you could, you could diagnose that. Here you see a baby which has a redistribution of blood flow, not because of the rhesus disease, but because of intrauterine growth restriction, because baby wants to 
send more blood towards the brain, you see much more blood is going towards the brain. You see, there is a redistribution of the flow. Yes. Here, if the baby has a high drops, and you can do the ultrasound of the uh, Doppler ultrasound of the middle cerebral artery, you can measure the velocities, you can predict whether this baby is going to be anemic or not. And if you think this baby is anemic, then you can go and take the blood sample, ultrasound guided needling of the umbilical vein, and then if the baby is anemic, you can immediately transfuse blood to the baby. And that is a 100% cure. Okay? Not to, in one go, you will have to do it several times because baby, it depends on when this thing happens. If, you, if it happens at 22 weeks, then up to 36 weeks, you may continue to do transfusions, you know, every, at least every alternate week or something like that. But eventually, it can be treated. And the results are getting better and better, as you see. These are the results from Stockholm, for example. All babies who had this procedure had survived, at least in the last last few years, right? And that is a very good thing. And remember, these babies used to die before, right? Many of them used to die before. It's a big change. Here is a baby with arrhythmia. Very, very fast heart rate, yeah? Baby's heart rate should be usually under 160 beats per minute, okay? And this is, of course, not normal. This baby has arrhythmia. Its heart will eventually fail, and this baby can die in utero, depending on who, which weeks in gestation it is. This baby has arterial flutter, has very fast heart rate, about you know about 400 uh, something beats per minute here. Yeah, and then it is the all the arterial contractions are blocked. So although the atria is contracting very fast, not all of them are conducting to the ventricle. And the ventricle contraction is about the half of that, 240 beats per minute, yeah, still very high. And this baby has already had some signs of heart failure with high drops. But we can treat this baby with antiarrhythmic drugs given to the mother that will cross the placenta, go to the baby, and baby will be perfectly fine, as you saw here, the normal heart rate of the treatment. And this baby can be delivered normally afterwards. Of course, it will need follow-up and other things, but in perfect, practically normal outcome. However, there are some gray zones, like in anything. Yeah. But what is the gray zone? When, in medicine, when available evidence does not help us to make informed decision about treatment, right? So here is a post-mortem image of a baby that has a something called congenital adenomatoid malformation of lung, a long name, C camp it is called. And this is the lung of the baby. Lung of the baby should be like this because they don't breathe inside the uterus. Yeah, they, their lungs are collapsed, right? Uh, and the, this lung has many cysts and is quite big. This heart is pushed from the left to the right hand side the, with the medicinal shift because of the, this lung be, being so big. And this baby can develop heart failure and die in utero. In certain condition, when there are pleural effusions, when there is hydrothorax, the lung, uh, the, in the pleura, there is a collection of the fluid, then you can put a shunt. You can put a needle, a thicker needle, a, a trocar, and put a little shunt into the um, cavity of the um, uh, thorax, and then bring that out to the amniotic cavity. So the, the fluid is drained out in the amniotic cavity. And then that may help to expand the lungs, right? Uh, you can do that for the cyst as well. But that depends on the situation. Here you see a fetus that I scanned initially at 17 weeks of gestation. That's quite early. And I saw C cam, this condition that I told you. And it had many, many cysts. They, they, they were eight. I couldn't, uh, there is no way of putting eight sons, right? It is not, not feasible to do that. Um, and there was, the, you know, the baby already has a heart failure, the high, high drops. A site is here, you see, okay? Uh, and so I was very negative about the outcome of this baby. I told the parents that this baby is unlikely to survive, perhaps, you know, you have a choice, 17 weeks, you could terminate the pregnancy, or of course, you know, we cannot really treat this baby in utero. So otherwise, just uh, you know, waiting to see what happens. 
the parents were not interested in the termination of pregnancy, which I can understand sometimes. That is how your convictions are, and that's fine. Yeah. And we went on with this pregnancy, and this baby became worse. Yeah. Here you see the head of the baby, and you see this is the thickness from the skin to the to the head, uh, the the scalp, the to the uh, scalp bones, the skulls of the baby, right? So from scalp to skull, it's a huge thickness here, right? That is edema, that is the swelling, yeah. But if you go back to this picture, you see there is a bad flow in the diastole uh, in the doctor's venosus doppler. That indicates heart failure. But then we went on and at 29 weeks, this became a bit better. Still high drops, still some, um, uh, some um, ascites left, but this baby's heart failure become better, okay? So here is the, at 29 weeks, ascites a little bit, but much better, uh, much, much better uh, doctor venosus Doppler. And then we continued at 31 weeks. Remember the head, how it looked like before? And completely normal, and you look at the side, this is no ascites at all, okay? This baby proved me wrong. Right? Um, there is always a hope. Yeah. So you have to be careful about judgment. You should not think you know everything. Okay? That is very important. Yeah. We have more and more twin pregnancies today because of reproductive technology as well. But especially the monochorionic pregnancy, when you have one placenta, or, or when, when one placenta and two uh, amniotic sharks or two, two babies, then uh, the risk is much higher than when you have two placentas, okay? And there are several conditions, um, twin polyhydraminous, oligohydraminous sequence, twin twin transfusion syndrome, uh, one baby is small, uh, selective growth restriction, uterine growth restriction, um, and the twin reverse arterial perfusion sequence, where one baby is just a lump of tissue that actually gets blood from the other baby, has no heart. So uh, different things can happen, okay? But some of these conditions today can be treated, okay? For example, if you have anemia, that can be treated by blood transfusion, as I told you. If you have intrauterine growth restriction, there is no real treatment, but you can, uh, you know, you can follow the baby and uh, time the delivery correctly, and uh, there are something you can do. Yeah. Uh, if you have here this baby is born, uh, one is very very um, pink, another one is a uh, little bit uh, pale. Yeah. So uh, they have this um, uh, taps, anemia polycythemia sequence, right? Um, if it is late in pregnancy, maybe you can treat them after they are <laughs> delivered, yeah? But if it is early and you have, for example, twin to turn transfusion syndrome, that is almost certain death of one of the baby, okay? That condition can be treated today. That happens because you have some anastomosis in the placenta that take blood from one baby to the other. One gets bigger, more blood supply, its heart has to pump more and more blood and eventually gets heart failure and hydropic, yeah? The other baby gets smaller, 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 and its kidneys fail. There is no amniotic fluid production. It is stuck on one side, and it becomes very, very little and anemic, okay? The other one is polycythemic, has high blood pressure, and has, you know, uh, a lot of amniotic fluid around it. That condition can be treated today by uh, doing laser surgery. So we go with a telescope inside the uterus, and then uh, find the vessels that are taking these uh, uh, anastomosis that are taking blood from one to other side, and you basically coagulate them. And that is a good treatment. And today, this is done with good results. About 90% uh, survival of one of the twins, uh, and um, 60 to 70% survival of both twins. And that's, that's quite good. Yeah, and uh, this procedure is also done here in Stockholm, in Hudinge Hospital. Yeah. And there are conditions that should not be treated perhaps in utero, but not at least not today. Maybe you will figure out how to do that in the future. Um, but you can treat, you must treat them and you should treat them after delivery, but they should be delivered in the right place to do that. And for example, this one, this baby has all its intestines outside. This is the picture after delivery. Of course, you can detect this before delivery. 
And this is the picture after the pediatric surgeons have done their surgery. Yeah, it's a, okay, if you want, somebody wants to have a defect, this is a quite nice defect to have, I would say, because then the outcome is usually okay, right? Yeah, but of course, <laughs> nobody wants to have any defects. Yeah. But there are some other things that are perhaps better prevented. We know that the risk of a neural tube defect having spina bifida anencephaly reduced by 70% if you just take folic acid before and during the first two, three months of conception. However, so every single woman of the reproductive age who does not take contraception and has sex should take folic acid, right? In general, that's the recommendation, but it does not happen. Yeah, we also do several things which perhaps we should not do, you know, about lifestyle and other things and okay, yeah, but you know, it's important to remember that um, we can avoid certain things and prevention is always better than cure. This condition actually there has been a quite big randomized controlled trial showing that if you do intrauterine surgery to close this defect, close this defect, not everyone you would fit in that criteria, but if you close that defect, the risk of disability becomes a little bit less, it ameliorates, it does not completely cure it. Do you understand me? Just so depending on just because there is a randomized trial does not mean that you have to jump into doing something because that also has the risk for the mother to do something and you know you have to make a big incident to the uterus, you have to do a big surgery uh, and then you have to do another surgery to deliver the baby. Uh, there are several things. So to consider before you decide what is the best kind of treatment for this mother. In Sweden, for example, many women will choose to have abortion if this kind of defect is detected. But there are countries where it is not allowed or it is, it is not the kind of norm. Uh, so what is the correct thing to do is not always for us to say. Yeah. It is a joint decision between patient, a doctor and the society and the legal system. Yeah? So there are many things to consider when you are a doctor. I think the specialty of obstetrics and gynecology is fantastic. It has many opportunities to do research, to understand disease mechanism, to help people to, uh, from, from, uh, from developing country to developed countries uh, with a big global perspective. And I would really encourage you to consider this as your future specialty or area of research. I would like to acknowledge my mentors and my um, co-authors, collaborators, uh, students uh, for being there and doing all the work they do. Thank you so much. <laughs>